Bye-bye. Hi, this is Max. Today is December 7, 2016. Today I will speak about mobility. Well then. First I will do a few announcements. First thing is that I invite your feedback. I'm doing a lot of new things. And please uh, comment these videos. I will look on uh, YouTube for your comments. And also you can write to me at max at humancolony.org. Second, we are inviting um, helpers to help with broadcast to set, set up the software and to moderate the webinars like what Bree does, the moderators and hosts for the shows. We invite donations for Jim's monitor. You, you can send them to, to max at humancolony.org via PayPal. We also have a nice archive of video, video of good videos on Human Colony uh, YouTube channel. And it would be nice to convert this archive into podcast format, basically to convert these videos into MP3, upload a podcast uh, provider, and then uh, let others to listen on their um, podcast applications on their smartphones. So we invite a helper who can take care of this technical uh, project. And the same thing can be converted, these mp3s can be converted to a radio, so that would be another project. So we would like to establish a radio station which would be uh, accessible through internet radio. And people could listen on their um, radio applications on their uh, smartphones. So now my intuitive understanding is that that very disaster which was predicted by many beings have, has been cancelled. So we were expecting a global economic collapse and uh, my understanding that maybe, likely, a, a, one big collapse, one big event causing a big collapse would be replaced, will be replaced by multiple bumps it will be a bumpy ride but not not that, not that deep so instead of one big shock many small bumps smaller bumps not very small but smaller bumps that's my understanding and i think it is because of um because we shifted to a new timeline basically so ask the ask the channel channeled beings these questions and uh, let's see what they say Either way, we shifted into a new stage of history, of the history, and, and the dominoes started, started to fall. So, a lot of changes are already happening, you can, you can already see, undeniably, changes happen faster. So, be prepared for a bumpy ride. I will share my memories from 30 years ago, where I experienced that bumpy ride in Russia in Soviet Union, which went through a big transformation. Late 80s, early 90s of the last century. I was around 25 at that time. And here comes the idea of mobility. Basically, old things don't work anymore. So the, fa the smartest, the safest way to go is to move, move on, move on, um, locally basically in, in loca location wise and move on in terms of practical things like move to new jobs move to new ways of life move to new environments one of the most profound conclusions from that transition in russia 30 years ago was that people died not because of hunger but because they couldn't adapt to the new changes they couldn't find their place in the new world so they lost the sense of belonging sense of connectedness and that what felt and that's why they got sick and basically left 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 the left, left the game left the drama so here is the a little story of one interesting move it wasn't a permanent it was it was just travel but uh 1987 uh Russia already went through multiple bumps. We had our leadership changed many times, maybe five times. 
And uh, my wife first uh, was pregnant with the first child, and it was spring of 87, and it was clear that we got to move somewhere in the, in the countryside because summers in Moscow are very unhealthy. It's um, hot and air is polluted with, uh, with air pollution, the, the smoke of the cars. So, so people vacate Moscow to the countryside. So the countryside around Moscow was pretty boring for us at that time. It wasn't where the action was. We didn't have any good friends in the countryside. We didn't have any good place to go. So at that point, I was fascinated by uh, this. I know in the fact that my Jewish ancestors came from Latvia, and also I visited Latvia a couple years before that. Just by, by coincidence, I just was sent there for, as a student, to study certain chemical production. So I visited Latvia, and Latvia was at that time a part of the Soviet Union. And to me, it still is one of the most westernized, most Germanized, most beautiful places on Earth. It is uh, an example of very nice people, uh, European people, uh, very nicely treating their land and very nicely taking care of their towns and cities. Beautiful. So I decided to find a place there to stay for the summer and, uh, and take there my wife and uh, mother-in-law. Had very little money from my work as a scientist. So I decided to maybe take a train and travel there. And when uh, I discovered that the tickets weren't there on the, on the train station, I decided to hitchhike. So it was sort of spontaneous. And at that time I had enough, I would say, stupidity. Yeah, enough stupidity to go do risky stuff. I didn't, I didn't, I wasn't scared. I didn't feel the danger. I was young and, and uh, unbalanced. Yeah, that's it. Young and unbalanced. So yeah, you, you know very little and you go and explore because you're young, about 24 maybe, 25. You go and explore. So I left home with a backpack, went to the train station, there was no tickets. I, I saw there is no point to come back because second time it would be harder to leave. So I, uh, by the train station, I, found, I saw the car where people would... Uh, come together and, and just chip in and divide the price and somebody was in a, and a driver was, was taking them towards Latvia not not yet to Latvia but towards Latvia so I decided I will pay and, and go so for me it was a very interesting way to immerse into different layers of society I normally wouldn't spend time with people from other layers I would be in my own niche in my own uh, social layer, speaking to my friends and their parents. And now I would, I would be locked in a car for, uh, for quite a while with people from a different social layer, like workers and uh, physical workers and something of that sort. It was very interesting. Not, nothing dangerous as it came out, but lots of learning. They laughed and they told stories and it was just a different vibration. Interesting, I learned a lot. Here is one of the stories. In 30s, 1930s, um, the country went through a big crisis as uh, the whole world went through the crisis in 29, so Russia also went through a big crisis. And um, it kept the order by basically robbing part of the robbing the countryside so there was a lot of destruction in the countryside and food was taken away from people and they lost their jobs so lots of people moved into the city and mainly into moscow and in saint petersburg these are two main cities so the lady i guess she was in her 60s that, that time maybe the lady in the car was telling the story that 
Or maybe she was even older. That she, her family went also into Moscow and uh, got hired on some physical works, maybe construction works. And they were provided with simplistic living conditions in multi-store buildings, concrete buildings with small apartments. And she was keeping chickens on the balcony and a goat in a, in a, in a bathroom. Because that's, that's how you get food and that's what she is used to do. Multi-store building, chickens on the balcony, a goat in the bathroom. Almost ecological disaster, but she took care of that. She was, was only worried that she could be captured doing illegal stuff. And uh, at some point she spoke to her neighbors and asked if um, the sound of chickens... If sound of the chickens is bothering the neighbor. The neighbor answered that no, uh, that the neighbor is missing uh, his own countryside life in the village and the chickens remind them home. So that made a big laugh in the car. So Russia was on the move very often. There was a lot of reforms. There was a lot of violence, wars, revolution, and things of that sort. So people moved often and usually not because of their own choice, but because they had to. And at that time, in those times, the information was very scarce. There was no internet, the newspapers were very censored, very much censored. So information was hard to find. Really, you have to know the ways to how to find the answers. And the key was, you know, when to move, whether to move and where to move. <laughs> when, whether and where. Usually there was no question whether to move, like you got to move, but when and where. There was a, a joke among, among my friends. Um, so the joke goes as follows. There are a group of Jews talking to each other. Another Jew comes to them and says, I don't know what you're talking about, but it is time to move. And uh, that was absolutely true. Like much of the conversation in among my friends and especially among the Jews was it's time to move and you know where will you move america or israel so at the time of change one of their typical things is that uh empire is generally the empire the country is generally the world is very generally pretty much universal and balanced universal and balanced so things are averaged around their country but in a time of change, some places uh, undergo big destruction and become really poor, and some places undergo and just keep the good economy and actually prosper. And it's not always that the, the, the city is prospering and the countryside is falling apart. Sometimes it's just the opposite. Sometimes the major disasters happen in the city, and moving away from the center is the smartest way to go. So I was, his, I was uh, going on the car with other people, then they dropped me off in, on the middle of, of, the, of the way, uh, in, in the middle of the, on the way to, to, to Latvia. Then I had to wait for the whole day, so, you know, just maybe for several hours, nobody was picking me up, because hitchhiking wasn't popular in, in Russia. So finally I got a, a truck which took me over to to Latvia, pretty much where I wanted to go, to the place of um, where my ancestors lived time before. So as you drive through Russia, you can see, basically it was Russian state, you can see a lot of decay and destruction. The countryside looks pretty much decaying and de destroyed. There is a lot of misarray, disarray, and signs of decay basically the buildings fall the, the fields are unkept the forests are rare and the road is bumpy and in poor condition so it was obvious when we crossed the the border with latvia latvia is another state which was conquered by russians during world war ii and until then it was uh, basically part of europe had European economy and European culture and its own language 
and was historically very much under German Lithuanian influence, German and Lithuanian. So the fact that they were under Russian rule for Soviet rule for about about 42 years uh, didn't completely destroy their way of life. So there was still a lot of care and order. So when we crossed the border with Latvia, it was just same federation, so there was no border patrol. The road became smooth and nice, well kept, nice asphalt, became wider. Um, the, the forests around the road became healthier. The fields around, the, around were green and well kept, and the fields were full with cows because Latvia is famous for, for their animal. It's famous for milk, basically. They, they do a lot of milk. And uh, in Russia, it was unthinkable to keep their jars for milk uh, outside of the house because they would be stolen, right? In Latvia, people would milk the cows, put a big metal jar outside on the porch, and a truck would go, yes, first collect the full jars and then go drop the empty jars, something like that. The truck would take them to the factory. So there was a lot of small farms, like single family farms, and they would all have cows and, uh, and milking industry and things of that sort. So I saw a very convincing proof of the advantage of European economy over Soviet economy. It was just, you cross the border and things become radically better economic-wise, economy-wise. I observed the same thing on the border of Estonian Soviet Union and Soviet Russian. It's like a little bit to the north, maybe three hour drive into the north east, and there is another place. There is um, two cities divided by a river, but basically it's the same city with two different names: Narva on Estonian side and uh, Ivan Gorod on Russian side, and they have long history of being conquered either by Germans or by Russians or by Vikings and so on. And uh, in Soviet time, these are, again, Estonia was under Soviet rule only for 40 years and you can still see when you cross the road how radically better was Estonian economy over Russian economy. In uh, Estonia, everything was well kept and uh, friendly. People smiled and so on. So culture and um, human culture and economic culture was way better. And in Russia, you just cross the road, cross the, the bridge, and you see a lot of destruction and a lot of scene in many ways, like dr drinkers and so on. A lot of anger and uh, poverty. I will conclude my um, collection of stories with a story from, uh, these are called Itzker books, Itzker books. These are the books which were collected by the Jews. Um, usually it was in America and Israel, basically the Jews who left who left Europe and then they just wanted to keep the memory, just to record the memory of um, their life in the in the Europe. So usually this would be Iskarbus were written by the communities in Israel and other countries of people who were um, yeah, basically who escaped the Nazis uh, before the World War or during the World War. So the European communities were the Jewish communities in Europe were destroyed, in, may, in most cases, completely. And uh, these books are the only thing which is left after these communities. So my, my other ancestors are coming from other Jewish ancestors, another line of grandfather, some Rempels. They come from a Rom Romania area, Romania and Moldova area. And the biggest city, the biggest Jewish place was called Kishinev, and a little smaller one was called Dubasar. So my ramples come from Dubasar. So Kishinev and Dubasar are 
most known known for how how different was um, the result of pogroms in there. So pogroms were basically the events where the masses of Russians and local, I guess, Romanians would go and uh, harass and destroy Jewish settlements in uh, in these um, cities. The most famous, the most disastrous uh, pogrom happened in 1903, and that's where many Jews left. Many Jews left Russia, and uh, that was the biggest uh, immigration wave of um, Jews to America, and that's where New York got lots of Jewish population. So the pogroms were organized by the uh, secret service of the government. They told the people that the police wouldn't interfere, and they supported the idea of going and harassing the Jews. It was prepared for a while, and on Kishinev it happened, and it had pretty bad consequences. Some people were killed, and lots of property was destroyed, and many people lost their sense of security in homes. In Dubasar, they also knew that pogroms are coming, but they self-organized. There was a sense of self-organization that prepared local self-defense group. They trained themselves organized the watch, the constant watch over the road approaching the Dubasar and uh, when the crowd of uh, people, pogromshik people, pogrom people were approaching, they just did several shots over the heads from guns and that was sufficient to turn the crowd around. So during the all the times before the uh, revolution of 1917 and after that there was never pogroms in Dubasar. They always had self-defense. But then Russian army came and and that was basically the end of the peaceful life. And they took away the goods and they changed the way of life. So they destroyed basically the economy of the of the area. So the Jews of the time of the place are uh, the young Jews learn the way of self-organization and becoming the warriors again. It, uh, the Jewish people lost the idea of being the warriors for many centuries since the Babylon, Babylonian exile. And the idea that they need to learn to be warriors again was new to many and many rejected it. But there was the so-called Zionist movement where young people would train themselves to become warriors again. And they would go and uh, move to Israel, to Palestine. So when the, the, the economy was destroyed and it was, it, you know, the area, the uh, Soviet area was very poor, people would try to escape to Romania and then through Romania to, through the Europe to, to the Palestine. It was a hard trip and it was uh, included illegal crossing the board crossing the board, which was guarded really well. So the, the author of this story in the Itzker book says that he and his friends and a lot of, and several other people uh, arranged that they will be taken in the boat over the river to the other side of the river to free Romania, which had the reasonable economy, and then they would be taken over further. Um, so they had to meet at a certain place on the river at night and they will be taken on a boat on the other side, someone who, who knows what he's doing. So he came and uh, um, there was too many people for the boat. So he was, he wanted to go but uh, another person of his age, basically from his, from his circle, bought the right, bought, bought his right basically. He paid more to the boat owner and uh, that, that, that gentleman who wrote the story was left behind and uh, the boat sank basically and everybody in, this, in the boat died. So he survived and then next time he would go again and he says we are waiting and waiting for the boat owner to come and uh, there's no one around and there is a patrol patrol, which kind of the military, Russian military would 
um, border guards would seek for the people who try to escape. And so he would be, would be hiding in the bushes. And he would clearly see uh, the darkness on the Soviet side. Everything is destroyed, no light, no life. And it, they could hear from the other side of the river the music and the songs and the laughter, and they could see the lights on, in, in the houses. They could see the free life on, on the other side. So after several nights of waiting and several tries, he finally escaped. He was captured by the police in Romania, and it took him another long time to, to get finally to the Palestine. But well, he made it, and he wrote the memoirs, memories. And um, he says it, that waiting in the night and knowing that you are escaping from, you know, from the dark side and there is a freedom on the other side was the, the feeling which was, I guess, one of the strongest in his life, when you are waiting to join that freedom. And uh, jumping now to, <laughs> jumping now to our reality, it is, I guess it is what we feel when we talk to the aliens, right? To the aliens from the three, from the free galactic world, <laughs> high dimension. We, we feel locked in the in the earth, which is heavy, and we want that lightness, right? We want the freedom, we want the lightness, we want the joy over there. Yeah, to, just to complete roughly complete my story, I I reached Latvia, I found a place, I um, rented a place, I took, brought my pregnant wife and the mother-in-law, and um, so. You know, they spent some. I spent some time there. They spent some time there, and uh, I came back home. And uh, they they came back home. For me, it was, I guess, the experience of the West and just understanding that I wanted to, <laughs> to leave Russia. You know, the life in the West is is uh, is what feels because Latvia, in large extent, was, you know, and still is, a symbol of the West. It is. Um, just a different mentality, I would say. Spiritually wise, yeah, spiritually wise, I, I wasn't smart for sure, but I had that sense of exploration. I needed to find uh, the truth. I needed to find the answer. I needed to find the way to go, and I wanted to take care of my family, basically. Yeah, and I had a sense of mission as well. I wanted to search and seek and share with others my findings. So I took risks, uh, and it was not smartness from the life. It was just instinctual, I guess. I just was the feeling that I, I got to explore. Something that I, where I am is not sufficient, is not good. I need to explore and find the better places. So I actively seeked for answers, and I actively traveled, explored, and searched for a better place, yes. I would go talk to people and eagerly observe. So when I went to the place, I I was into art, so I was looking at architecture, at beauty of the things, and spoke to people and and had to kind of gauge the feeling. And you know, every, as I travel, I would say to myself, it, it's always like a main question: Would I would I like to live here? How would it be to live here? And if I live here, what, what would I do? What would be, would be my profession? What would be my contribution? Also, that period of life, I wanted my connection to ancestors. And that was my way of connecting to them. I would go to the places where they have been and uh, just breathe that air, see the places that, which were dear to them where they lived and connected to these energies. Of course, at that time, I wasn't aware of, not of course, but I wasn't that much aware of, of the aliens, but I felt like an alien in Russia and uh, basically on Earth. So I was still at that stage where I was moving around places and trying to find what is my home, where is my people, and why I feel foreign here, right? So each of you, I think, can uh, empathize with that. <laughs> Just traveling around, trying to find which 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 is your people, and uh, finally I found you. So our home is somewhere here, 
right in this, uh, I guess, Hukula community, right? So um, I welcome every one of you home. You finally arrived. Right, have a good day. I have tons more stories about memories and the movement and um, and hard times and how to adapt to them. Certain principles. So I hope to continue this series. This series. Thank you much. And write to me. Comment this video and comment. Send me your comments to max at humancolony.org. Goodbye.